No response. Senator Castlin. No response. Senator Givens. Here. Thank you. Senator Kerr. No response. Senator McGarvey. No response. Senator Meredith. Present in the room. Thank you. Senator Nemus. Present in the room. Thank you. Senator Webb. No response. Senator West. Present from the 27th District. Thank you. Representative Beckler. No response. Representative Bentley. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Blanton. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Bridges. Thank you. Representative Dossett. Present from my office. Thank you. Representative Fisher. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Fleming. Ditto. Thank you. Representative Flood. Present from the 75th District. Thank you. Representative Fugit. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Gentry. Present in the 46th District. Thank you. Representative Goforth. No response. Representative Hale. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Hart. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Hatton. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Nemus. Here. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Palumbo. Here in my office in the annex. Thank you. Representative Prunty. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Raymond. No response. Representative Reed. Here in the room. Thank you. Representative Riley. No response. Representative Santoro. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Tipton. Present in the room. Thank you. Representative Wilner. Here in the 35th House District. Thank you. Chairman McDaniel. Present room. Thank you. Co Chair Petrie. Present in the committee room. All right. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We uh, appreciate that. And uh, as the members of this committee will note, um, there was one name that wasn't called today, and that's Senator Buford. Um, we would be remiss to start this meeting. I'm sure everyone in the audience is well aware that uh, Senator Buford passed yesterday, and uh, he is someone whose wit and intellect and ability to say things to make the rest of us cringe in public settings will be sorely missed. Um, but he was a wonderful man. He was dedicated to his district. He loved this job. Uh, in fact, I was told that he had called uh, as recently as a week ago to let everybody know that he would be here today. Um, and so we will miss him sorely. And uh, for the time being, I would ask for a moment of silence for Senator Buford. Thank you all very much. Very well. First item of business on the agenda today is approval of the minutes from June 2nd, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. By Co-Chair Petrie, second by Representative Reed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. You guys have it. The motion carries. The minutes are adopted. Okay, we're going to rearrange just a little bit in the uh, agenda today to let some folks get on about things. Uh, we're actually going to jump to item number five, pandemic relief uh, with uh, the State Budget Director, John Hicks. Director, come on up, please, sir, and proceed. Director, I think your microphone is off. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to seek assistance from your able staff. So, give me one moment. Sure. If you're ready, we're ready. All technical difficulties. Well, let me, I'll, I'll just open. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee for having me here. Uh, you, you asked for an update on uh, something that is getting is really, really big. You know, federal pandemic funding that has come, i label it, to and through Kentucky state government. All right, so these are, these are, these are funds that have been awarded to the state agencies uh, and to the Commonwealth, uh, and in some cases passed through passed through to, to other entities. And so uh, in, in my, great, thank you. All right. So a little retrospective, there were seven federal acts that essentially appropriated funds related to COVID-19, relief, recovery, assistance, uh, federal pandemic funds. Um, and the information that we have in the materials today 
when you compile it, is literally a 250 row spreadsheet of the number of the different grant awards that were received by the Commonwealth, by state government, uh, which act that came from, how much the award was or is estimated to be, uh, and uh, how much has been spent uh, through late June. So an update on that. So, so this is uh, the first time in my career I've been forward to this committee to testify on a 250 row spreadsheet. But, uh, but that just shows you a little, it's another image of, of the extent and breadth of the assistance that has flowed to and through uh, Kentucky state government. So here, here's just a, a, by calendar, the listing of federal acts and their names. Uh, uh, starting in the you know, spring of 2020, you know, uh, four quick actions by the U.S. Congress, the most notable of which, uh, the first notable was the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, that $867 million. That's mostly all Medicaid. What they did then was permitted all, gave all states an additional enhanced federal share of 6.2% for the duration of the public health emergency, which is determined by the Secretary of Health and Human Services cabinet in, in Washington. Uh, and then the CARES Act, late March uh, of 2020. Uh, one everybody knows by that name. Uh, here's our kind of current compilation, you know, $7 billion. Now we'll say about you know, 4.7 of that is unemployment insurance benefits. So the single biggest piece of that number is, is, is claims payments uh, to those who are unemployed. Uh, and then a couple of small ones, uh, that came through and uh, had a few things. And then uh, then late December, when uh, Congress was also dealing with the ex with their federal budget at the time, uh, they, they passed the Coronavirus, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, so a pretty significant amount of $2.2 billion. Uh, and then uh, just you know a few months ago in March, the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, again, and these are moving targets, particularly on the American Rescue Plan Act. Not all the funds have been officially awarded or noticed uh, to all the recipient state agencies. Most of them have, uh, but there's still some, you know, that are outstanding. So in total, $16.9 billion of about $5 billion of which was the unemployment insurance benefits. So if you kind of set that aside for a million, $11, $12 billion uh, for the various programs. And one thing that, uh, that was similar to the Recovery Act back in the Great Recession was most of these funds flowed through existing federal programs. Uh, there, then there were some new programs. You heard testimony this morning from our Department of Education about the elementary and secondary uh, education uh, uh, emergency fund. Uh, kind of a, a new program, but they said you could spend it on the existing programs, Title I, IDEA, those kinds of things. Uh, but, but in the main, uh, most of these funds are flowing through existing programs, which is really an efficient way to do this kind of business. Uh, because we already have structure, processes, guidelines, you know, that enable uh, the agencies. I'll give you an example, the Child Care Development Block Grant, a lot of money going through it. Uh, the Low Income Housing uh, uh, Heating and Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP. Uh, uh, a lot of the programs that the Public Health Department runs through the Center for Disease Control, uh, those, th those are through existing statutory programs. So that, as a matter of, of government uh, processing and efficiency has been is very helpful and was a lesson learned from the the uh, Great Recession and the American Recovery Act. Here is a compilation. This is the first time I'd ever done this uh, at your all's request was to attempt to compile it by cabinet. All those seven acts, all the awards that we know of and uh, uh, and with the exception of the item at the bottom uh, in, in descending order by, by amount of money. So labor cabinet, the bulk of that is unemployment insurance. Uh, the Department of Education, uh, very significant <laughs> amount of funding that has escalated, particularly with the American Rescue Plan Act, which you all heard testimony in the subcommittee this morning, about $2 billion coming in the American Rescue Plan Act and another 900 in the, the Coronavirus Supplemental Act uh, that was prior to that. Uh, health and Family Services, uh, a lot of funds flowing through our Department of Public Health, through our Department of Community-Based Services, uh, I mentioned the LIHEAP program. There's also the pandemic EBT program, uh, the child care. In the child care area, the existing programs, the funds that come through there, in total over a billion dollars uh, coming through to Kentucky State Government to child care 
uh, recipients and, and providers, uh, really significant when you add it all up from among three different federal acts. Um, uh, Medicaid is in there. We're right about 851 million life to date for that enhanced federal share. Uh, in general government, uh, you know, that doesn't tell you anything. That's where the funds that are flowing through cities and counties, uh, both through the coronavirus relief fund, over 320 million, and uh, and and the Department of Local Government acts as the dis, as the uh, distributor of the recent American Rescue Plan Act, 300 million dollars to most of our cities. They call them non-entitlement units, not the counties and not the nine or ten largest cities in Kentucky. So so that's in there as well. Uh, the, our Emergency Management Division and Military Affairs, is, who did early on all of the PPE and medical supplies and their distribution is in that general government number as well. Uh, Post-secondary education, similar to K-12 education, there have been three iterations of the Higher Education Emergency uh, Relief Fund. Uh, in most cases, at least half of that money is going directly to students who have certain needs. So not all that is going to the institutions to assist them in, in mitigating the cost of the additional cost of responding to COVID-19. Uh, but three different versions, just like the K-12 version as well. Uh, finance administration, that's basically with a typo on administration. Uh, that's uh, mostly the, emer the uh, emergency eviction relief money that flows through finance to the Kentucky Housing Corporation, who's actually administering the program. Uh, and so that's where a, a lot a lot of that is. Transportation, uh, 252 million of that, 164 million in one chunk was what we got from the Coronavirus Recovery Supplemental Act, uh, and that was for highways uh, and and with with very good usage. Uh, back in the Recovery Act, when we got some uh, some of the some of the federal funds there uh, that were to be shovel ready. Uh, really had some other sections of the pro of the funding that you needed for these these longer term projects. Here, the Congress basically provided monies to states to go do the things that they do on a routine basis ha and have designs for and get get the money out. So so th so uh, they certainly learned the lesson from the Great Recession. Justice and public safety. Uh, a lot of that is the coronavirus relief fund that we all work together in the budget process where we had a capability to leverage those federal dollars in relief of state dollars. So think of corrections, our state police, and our juvenile justice were the primary agencies in which uh, the federal government, U.S. Department of Treasury gave us an ability uh, to presume the expenses of payroll for many of those agency staff to be eligible expenses and therefore we didn't have to pay for them with general or road fund. Uh, so, so that's a highlight. In fact, it was four, almost $400 million in the last two fiscal years that really were baked in the budgets uh, for fiscal 20 and 21 that you all ultimately enacted. Economic development, that's a single program that came out of the uh, uh, recent uh, federal legislation. This is a small business uh, credit initiative that's going to enable lenders to provide financing to uh, small businesses who are financially able, able, but may be outside of the lending practices. Uh, this is a, it's about 80 plus million dollars. It is a multi-year program. It's one that was repeated from the Recovery Act. We had something very similar you know, about 12 years ago. So the Economic Development Cabinet folks who are over there, some of them helped administer that program. So that's, that's a pretty interesting one and one that'll help small businesses across Kentucky. Public Protection Cabinet, you know, what are they doing with federal dollars? Well, they administered uh, the bar and restaurant relief program that uh, was funded out of the coronavirus relief program, and they're also administering the uh, uh, return to work uh, incentive uh, for unemployed uh, Kentuckians. Uh, in the personnel cabinet, uh, the, con the Commonwealth administers the Kentucky Employees Health Insurance Plan. It is a, you know, the largest group in the state, includes state government, all of the school districts, uh, and, and many other uh, entities, and we incurred a number of hospitalization costs associated with individuals who were employees and their family members who were infected by COVID-19 and had hospitalization. Uh, we also had workers' compensation payouts for, for similar things, uh, both both uh, for those who were disabled and uh, and those who who died. Um, education, workforce development—that's uh, that's a handful of items uh, in tourism. Uh, 
they recently received from the federal government a $2.8 million grant for tourism marketing. The governor previously had allocated $5 million from the Coronavirus Relief Fund for, for something uh, previous to that similar. Uh, the to-be-determined billion dollars, that is the amount of the American Rescue Plan Act state fiscal recovery fund that you have not yet appropriated. Right? In the 21 session, you all appropriated about half of the $2.1 eight billion dollars that Kentucky's uh, slated to receive so that's the the TBD there uh, and judicial and legislative branches as, as we as we started the implementation of the coronavirus relief fund uh, state agencies were eligible to seek reimbursement for costs that were related in response to COVID-19 both the judicial and legislative branch had some of those so that's that's just a quick run through uh, here is a, a listing of the top 15 by dollar figure. You know, I've talked about some of these. Let me make a comment about that first item that says 2.084. On June 25th, when I was finishing up working this, this document, the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education, uh, corrected that number down to about 2 billion, 1 million. So, so that's an update. The, the Department of Education this morning had the correct number, uh, so I want to just point that out. But that, you know, the biggest number on the page outside of unemployment insurance benefits uh, for our schools. And then the second biggest number uh, individually uh, was, was the 928 out of the Coronavirus Recovery Supplemental Act. Then the Medicaid number, uh, child care stabilization, which was a new type of program out of the uh, American Rescue Plan Act, uh, $470 million, part of that billion dollars total I mentioned. And then... Uh, then you'll see a version of the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, the assistance to cities and counties, when you see the letter CRF, and sorry for all the acronyms, uh, that's the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, and you can see the expenditures there, uh, nearly finished with that. Uh, and then the local fiscal recovery fund, brand new out of the American Rescue Plan Act that the Department of Local Government will be distributing those funds any day now. Several versions of the Child Care Development Block Grant, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program that is run by the Kentucky Housing Corporation. And then in public health, this is a, an example of the programmatic name of the funds that flowed through to public health. Uh, uh, they may have called them something in the press release, testing, tracing, mitigation, all kinds of things, but this was the formal title. Uh, several things I've already mentioned there, and then the Federal Highway Surface Transportation Block Grant. So just the top 15. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side the expenditures where they're blank, uh, you know, they're mostly the American Rescue Plan Act funds that, you know, haven't, haven't had a chance to get started yet. Uh, uh, and then one caveat, uh, did not have the information on spending up to date from the public post-secondary institutions, so that is missing here, uh, and, and, uh, and would, 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 because they certainly have been spending those funds preceding the American Rescue Plan Act. So, Mr. Chairman, I was trying to think of how to do this in a reasonably short period of time with a, with a lot of information, so I'll be happy to stop there and answer any questions. Okay, very well. I've got a couple, and then we've got some from the floor as well. First, uh, John, in the event that there are unspent monies affiliated with these different things, what happens to that to those funds? I'd say in in the main, let me talk about the uh, the existing programs in which they put in more money. Uh, so so they will uh, uh, they return to the federal government. So so if we didn't draw down, you know, ten percent of a hundred million dollar grant, it would never come. If in a, in a manner of speaking, it would be retained by the federal government. Uh, and I'm not familiar with reallocation processes. In the normal course of events, uh, when 50 states get an, uh, an allocation from a federal program and a state doesn't use all of it, there are periods in which they can reallocate it to other states. So that's not always the case in every program. But in this case, it would stay with the federal government is the answer because we would not have drawn it down. With, with one, a couple of exceptions. Uh, the coronavirus relief fund, we got all the money up front. The state fiscal recovery fund, the $2.183 billion, we got, we got half of that money up front, and we'll get the other half in about 12 months. So those are a little bit different, and if we don't spend those, Mr. Chairman, we give them back, uh, in, specifically to the U.S. Department of Treasury. And there is the potential they just end up reallocated to someone else. In their yes, but they've others. also got, uh, actually their, their law doesn't permit that. Uh, for those two pots of money. Uh, the statute does not allow that to be reallocated. Gotcha. And then secondarily, um, on the money that came down on March the 27th for the Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic 
Security Act. You've still got a, that's that's a fairly flexible fund, I believe. You got about four hundred million dollars left. Do you guys have anticipated expenditures for that yet? Oh yes, yeah, definitely so. Yeah, this is a compilation of, of many. Uh, are you talking about the CARES Act, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yes, uh, I am unaware. I'll say at this point of of any expectations to not spend it all. What What are the expectations to spend that balance on? Uh, on, but well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples because that is the CARES Act. Uh, we're. I mean, me. of, of the unappropriated amount at this point. On the CARES Act. Yes, I believe all that. Uh, I, I have to look through here. I, I, again, I'm, I don't expect that we won't spend it. I expect we will spend it all. If you could just give us an idea. There, it's sure. just about 400, just shy of 400 million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know where you're intending to put that. All right. Uh, Representative Titton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate your presentation, Director Hicks. Uh, this morning, specifically, uh, get some clarification on the $164.7 million the transportation for highways are, are we talking about i assume we're talking about state projects yes uh, sir that are, are already in our transportation budget or could there be future projects included in this we come back in session I, I can't say with certainty but i do know that among the uses are maintenance you know resurfacing okay. you know things that would be uh, you know kind of already in the mill uh, because they want to spend the money in a timely not way. Not necessarily new projects, but more projects, maintenance type projects, that bridge would, replacement, things like that. Absolutely, they had a they had a very we we were states were pleased with the breadth of the ability to spend that money in ways that they were already cranking it out. And, and that will free up some of our own money to possibly to use on other items. It, it certainly was excess to you know to our budget. Okay, Mr. Chairman, one additional question. Uh, on the emergency rental assistance, I know that there have been programs between landlords and tenants to work out uh, to prevent eviction. I see there's a new round of monies mm -hmm. here. Uh, how successful has that been, and are people aware that they can participate in that? Well, I know that we had our first uh, stab at that by using some of the coronavirus relief funds, I think like a $40 million mm -hmm. uh, grant award where the housing corporation really got started. They, you know, they fully subscribed uh, in a reasonable period of time. And then the large amounts of money came in and, and that truly was, was unexpected, but, but please. And so I haven't had much discussion with the housing corporation recently about that representative Tipton, but uh, I know that that first slug of money gave them the ability to to broadcast the information out to mm -hmm. community action agencies yeah. other community organizations uh, landlord sure. groups you know uh, and so i think it's built upon one another uh and i think the media has done a reasonably decent job mm -hmm. just sitting wa reading the papers and watching te television and saying that there are programs available uh, well, the moratorium on evictions keeps getting yeah. extended but yeah. at some point in time that's going to stop that's right that's right but i, I will say that uh uh, we've got a substantial amount of funds available, you know, and in the last iteration, you know, you know, there was a for, there was an ability to pay rent forward for a period of time, not just retroactive. And so, uh, so I, I hope that people who may have opportunity to listen to this and are in need, you know, will contact their local community action agency uh, and other other social service groups who will know where to point them to. Very well, Senator Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Hicks. I'm over here to the Sorry. left of you. Uh, the basic process uh, that the executive branch went through to, to distribute a lot of these funds, w was there a fundamental structure put together for each cabinet in order to submit information to get approval uh, for these funds as they came in? And, and, and I say that as, as a recipient uh, provider of some of the funds, uh, it, it was obvious that uh, that's at times the process was hurried a little bit and maybe not completely thought through. Uh, and I can imagine it was logistically it was a struggle to uh, to to be able to appropriate all, all of these dollars coming in all at once. But uh, did it did it all run through your office or what was the basic structure? Well, first, kind of going back to a comment I made earlier, Senator Carroll, is much of this money went through existing programs and and almost all of it is formula based allocation so you so you didn't have to 
prove you needed $50 million. You, you got it by the formula. And then secondly, by running it through the existing programs, we already had the structures in place. Uh, with some twists, you know, the provider relief fund, something very different, you know, is going directly to providers from uh, HHS uh, at the federal level. But in, in, in the main, it was definitely more work, but it wasn't, un, uh, uh, unex, uh, it wasn't uninformed work, right? The uh, Cabinet for Health and Family Services, you know, I think of the agencies in state government who are also grant-making agencies work or pass-through agencies. They have great structures great reporting capabilities because many of the reporting requirements on these were uh, similar to that which they were already used to uh, with some some new differences so so in in that that's the bulk of the fund so that that didn't have you know let's say the need for more structure it was already there for the things like the coronavirus relief fund uh, the governor uh, you know took the helm on that asked our office to play the in intermediary uh, with state agencies uh, in terms of the first round, what I was mentioning about reimbursing state agencies for eligible expenses, and then other decisions to be made like our emergency management uh, and going through public health for all the testing and tracing and uh, uh, expenses and long-term care facility support. So that part was highly structured and went through the governor's office uh, in terms of uh, how much and who and for when uh, and for what. Uh, the Corona, the State Fiscal Recovery Fund, the $2.183 billion from the American Rescue Plan Act, you know, uh, you all appropriated uh, $300 million for broadband, $250 million for water and wastewater, $575 million to repay the UI unemployment federal loan, uh, $37 million for some mitigation and, uh, uh, and response uh, in congregate and vulnerable settings. So, so in that regard you all you all played the final role at deciding there and and for that to be determined billion dollars you know the governor will make a recommendation in in, in the budget and you all will make those final decisions so but looking backwards and kind of answer your question the capability of not just kentucky state government but our peer state governments to be able to handle this amount of money was was very well done and is in place and they, you know, when, when they have to maybe augment a little bit because of the size of the amount that we've been able to do that, I've, I've indicated, I've seen no indications of difficulties in responding to the auditor's office when the single audit uh, came out. You know, the auditor's office needs to go and, and audit, you know, sample these programs. Uh, when uh, uh, the inspector generals of the respective few federal departments who are also now heavily responsible for monitoring the use of these funds, when they've had... Uh, 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 when they have looked at these issues, we haven't heard of anything uh, untoward, uh, you know, in, in regard to uh, a lot of these grant programs. So, uh, so it was a lot to come at, I'll say, the, the state employee staff that handled this, but really well done. And in the Department of Public Health, who not only had to be a lead on the response in general to the COVID-19 on behalf of the Commonwealth, was a significant recipient of a lot of these federal dollars. And, and in that area, every one of these big pots of money, they have to submit a plan. Uh, to HHS, to CDC, uh, on how you're going to spend this money and over what time and on what eligible elements. So uh, that was one of the areas where you had to come back with a very specific set of, here's what I plan to do with, with these funds within their eligible categories. Thank you, Director Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very well. Last one, Senator Gibbons. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and Director Hicks, thanks for the presentation. We've communicated well throughout the process, and we've shared some concerns with you, and you've always listened to us on those. One of the concerns that continues to be there for me and others, and, and this is a concern you've heard already from us, is the potential that we use some of this money to create or expand programs, and then when the money runs out, we're stuck with the question of, oh, we'd like to continue it. So please always continue to, to earmark, uh, mark, highlight, use your red pen and circle, those things that we're doing that but for this money we otherwise may not have been able to do. So thought. my second thought is to ask you to speculate some, which is always hazardous, but entertaining at the same time. The Ohio case last, last week, there was a case in federal court in Ohio last week related to something we talked a lot about through the budgeting and allocation process of not being able to use the COVID-19 relief funds in a situation where a tax cut or a tax reduction applied. The federal court in Ohio, specific solely to Ohio, as I understand it for now, 
rule that the federal treasury cannot enforce that because it's too vague. Are you monitoring that? Speak to that, and and what are your thoughts? No, thank you, Senator Gibbons. Um, and and in our decision making, to the extent that we had discretion, we are assuring that we're not imposing recurring obligations on the Commonwealth by the use of these funds. That every agency who's receiving these understands that it's one time, uh, and 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 that it will go away. So that to your first comment. Secondly. You know, as, as it related to the American Rescue Plans Act State Fiscal Recovery Fund, that is the program in which the Ohio uh, court decision and issue is, is around. And one of, the, one of the ineligible uses of the, that fund is to basically supplant or replace uh, revenues that were reduced because of uh, tax policy actions. Use that as a simple way of saying that. In essence, they were saying, just don't backfill our money with, with your reduction. It doesn't prohibit any state from reducing taxes. There is no, 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 nothing in the federal law that says states can't reduce taxes. You just can't turn around and use the, that federal pot of money to replace the portion of your taxes that were reduced by that tax policy action. And, and so I had not seen, thank you for the reference, I'll take a look at that. Uh, uh, about the vagueness, but uh, I'll call it the problem statement is is that, is that you couldn't go and cut the, the marginal rate of the income tax by X percent and, and say the cost was X million dollars, turn around and toss the same amount of money from the state fiscal recovery fund into it. You could, you know, as long as you just don't replace it. Uh, and I will say that the federal guidance that came out for cities and counties and states, because we're all in the same situation in that rule, uh, was uh, pretty much to our benefit, meaning the manner in which you define general revenues, which was the key. You define general revenues as being certain sorts of dollars, and you know, and, and that, and then if then you compare it over time, three three particular periods in the forward, uh, and uh, and it was uh, they listened to. I'm going to just say the federal government listened to cities and counties and states when they said about how you would fashion the guidance on this. Uh, such that it could be monitored and, and complied with in a, in a reasonably uh, reasonable way. Uh, so, you know, so I, I never saw that as a as a threat or a concern uh, because because I, I thought that was pretty clear. Uh, and and the U.S. Treasury even specifically came out with an announcement before they even came out with the guidance that said, "We're not going to tell you what to do with your tax policy at the local and state level. You just can't supplant it." Is, is, is kind of the, simil the, the basic message, uh, and, you know, and I have no concerns moving forward on that one in terms of could, could any legislative body reduce a tax and, and be threatened with the loss of some of these funds? The answer is no, as long as you didn't backfill it. All right, and I missed one follow-up from Senator Carroll, or is we're going to head over there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I apologize. And kind of along the, the same lines as far as reoccurring expenses, but – but not really coming from the state government, uh, but from recipients uh, of some of these funds. Uh, a lot of the funding is geared towards wage increase uh, for employees. And uh, you may not have a response to this, Director Hickson, and, and it's, uh, I just don't know if this has been part of the discussion, but uh, there is a push in a lot of areas to increase wages. Uh, the fear is that when some of these funds run out, uh, you, obviously, for your organization, you want to maximize to be able to get as much of the, the uh, assistance as you can, uh, and some of it being tied towards wage increases, I'm afraid uh, there will be a tendency to try to maximize it. Uh, wages will be increased, and then when the federal funding goes away, some of these organizations uh, may not be able to sustain uh, that level of pay. Uh, so it's a little concerning that... that uh, we've basically created a false economy, a temporary false economy that's going to lead to wage increase and what's gonna happen when this false economy goes away and we're hit by a wave of recession. And you may or may not have a comment to that, sir. I just, uh, it's just an observation that I've seen coming from the recipient end uh, mm -hmm. of some of these, these dollars. So you're going to pass on that? Yeah, I'll pass okay. on. I'll pass on because <laughs> that, that, that 
because it's not true at the state government level, but you're talking about, you know, talking about providers of various sorts who are ultimate recipients and who may take advantage of the eligible use, for example, yes. premium bonuses, right? That was a phrase in the American yes. Rescue Plan and Act. And it, uh, it's just fear of the repercussions of taking advantage sure. of that as, yeah. as, as things change and, and uh, those dollars are spent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I've just, just went through that process with, with the organization that I lead and we we're having to be very careful mm -hmm. not to overextend ourselves as a not-for-profit and be stuck three years from now you know, struggling, and uh, and I'm I'm sure that applies in a lot of different areas with some of the stipulations uh, that have been put on these funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, very well, and Representative Nemus, briefly. Thank you. I know a lot of states have ended their declarations of emergency. I don't think their funds are in jeopardy, but I just want to ask you the question. Uh, it's almost time to remove our official um, or formal declaration of emergency. When Governor Bashir does that, are any of these funds can um, in jeopardy? No, sir. Thank you. All right, very well. One last thing, Director, uh, on the those unexpended funds we talked about earlier, just the uh, normal admonition from the legislative to the executive branches, we would certainly expect that the governor will be running those through the normal appropriations process, being as we are largely through the emergency portion of this. And uh, we do appreciate your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, next up, back to our regular agenda here, inflation on and impacts on future economy. Uh, John and Katie, come on up. Guys, before you get going, just identify yourself for the record, please. Sure. John Runker, Chief Economist here at the LRC. Katie Scott, Staff Economist at the LRC. And uh, thanks for having us here today. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, sit here and talk to you a little bit about um, inflation and how we measure inflation and uh, how the Federal Reserve uh, attempts to control inflation. Um, I'm going to let Katie take over. She's my she's my macro economist, so this is this is her cup of tea. So I'll turn it over to her. So, we're I'm here to talk about um, inflation, the Consumer Price Index, Federal Reserve, and some examples of previous history of inflationary and deflationary uh, periods before we ad address kind of what's going on currently. So real quick, what is the theory of inflation and what is inflation? I know you guys are all familiar with it, but I'm just going to give the academic definition. Inflation is a sustained increase in the general price level in an economy over a period of time that affects the overall cost of living. Um, and just for my benefit, I like to think about what the variables affecting inflation as four main variables, where it's the amount of dollars in the account economy, so the um, actual physical amount of dollars, the velocity of money, which is actually the speed of spending. So it's how quickly, you know, if I get a dollar, how quickly do I turn around and spend that dollar? How quickly does that move through the economy? Um, so I'm going to call it velocity because speed of spending is a little difficult. And then we're also going to do uh, the amount of goods to purchase in the economy. So all of these play a role in the economy, and I kind of illustrate that on the equation, uh, which is MV equals PG. Um, but I like to think about it as more of a scale. So if there is a shift in one side, there's going to be a shift in the other until it evens out. So there are a lot of moving pieces with this. So just for example, let's say the consumer confidence in the economy increases. People start spending their money faster. Um, so we have a velocity that goes up. So some variable in this equation is going to have to move until they reach equilibrium again. So it could be the price level. 
It could be the amount of goods available if producers want to produce more goods to satisfy the increased demand, or it could be the money supply. So inflation is really important because it affects all households and all levels of the economy. So how do we measure inflation? Uh, we measure that through the Consumer Price Index, which we pay a lot of attention to. It gets a lot of press coverage. Um, so we collect data from surveys, and we ask everyone what prices do they see, what prices do they spend on different items that they've been purchasing. Um, so we collect all of this data that's representative of the average American household, and we call it a, ba a market basket. So we weight the prices that households spend more money on heavier than what people spend less money on. So changes in the price of bed are weight, bread are weighted heavier than a change in the price of a movie ticket. Um, so after this market basket is constructed, um, that's how we get our CPI number. Um, and I'd just like to point out that there's the CPI, which is what we read in the headlines. And then we have the core CPI, which removes food and energy prices because those are viewed as uh, volatile. And um, some economists think that it doesn't let you see the actual changes in the price level. So how do we control the price level? It affects everyone. Um, we have a way to measure it. Um, controlling the inflation and the price level is the job of the Federal Reserve, which is actually an independent agency that's statutorily mandated to ensure maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. A lot of the times, long-term interest rates are wrapped up in maximum employment and stable prices, so we refer to it as the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve. So that's the role of the Federal Reserve, but um, they only have a few tools that they can use to control inflation. Um, so they use it by controlling the money supply. Um, so there are three ways that they can control inflation. They can change the federal funds rate, which is what we refer to when we're talking about the interest rate faced by the um, when we are talking about the Fed changing the interest rate. It's actually the rate that the bank lends to each other, the interest rate on the bank's lending, and then we see lower interest rates from that. So it is done by increasing the money supply, but it also lowers the velocity of money because it's more expensive to get credit. So it kind of slows some things down. Um, there's also changing the reserve ratio, uh, where banks don't actually keep all of the money in a vault. They only keep a portion of it, and then they invest and lend out the rest. Um, so if the Federal Reserve sets the amount that they have to keep in a vault, so if they say that banks now need to keep a higher percentage of the money in a vault, it effectively removes that money because it's literally put in a room and locked and it's out of the economy. And then lastly, there's open market operations, which would be buying and selling treasury bonds. So. If I wanted to buy a treasury bond and I had $100, I would give it to the Federal Reserve and they'd give me a piece of paper that would say that they owed me $100, but they'd have the actual money of that $100. And so they'd keep that for themselves, not put it back into the economy, and that gets that $100 out of circulation. Um, so those are like the main tools that the Federal Reserve can use to uh, kind of control inflation. And I just wanted to talk about some previous uh, price changes that we've seen kind of in recent history. Um, so a lot of the news and a lot of the headlines are talking about the inflation that we saw in the 1970s. Um, so this period was referred to as stagflation because there was very little economic growth and a lot of inflation. So there was a stagnating economy. Um, a lot of economists now point to um, easy money policies um, where they were trying to stimulate economic growth and increase employment as kind of starting this trend. And then we had um, a very large fluctuation in energy prices and food prices. Um, so just to show you that, um, the energy CPI went up to 48%, and that was at a period of time when inflation was almost 15%. Um, so also during this time, inflation expectations actually began driving inflation as well. So um, 
you have escalation clauses and business contracts to keep up with the current CPI. You have cost of living increases, and that kind of also stimulated inflation. So what the Federal Reserve did is they increased interest rates drastically, removed a lot of things from the money supply, and then we were able to kind of get out of this like increasing inflationary pressures. So then we have the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And although we didn't see a lot of inflation necessarily, we did see uh, some deflationary periods. Um, so this was a sharp drop in consumer confidence and consumer expenditures. The velocity of money, the speed at which people spent it dropped 18%. Also, banks didn't want to lend money. So even though the Fed was trying to get the money supply to increase through the usage of the tools that they have available, the banks saw too much risk in the economy and weren't letting the money go into the, um, the average economy where households would be. Um, and this also began an era of historically low interest rates and low inflation and even some deflationary pressures. So at the bottom there, I talk about the increase in the money supply, but we have a decrease in velocity. So price kind of kind of started modulating up and down. And then now we have the great lockdown, which is what the IMF has named this current period. Um, and I'm just presenting the equation um, because there are so many moving pieces happening right now. So first we have changes in the money supply. That's increased almost 74% compared to pre-pandemic levels of new money injected into the economy. We also have been having a lot of change in the speed of spending or the velocity of money. Um, there was a sharp drop in consumer confidence. The velocity of money dropped almost 77% at its lowest point. But now we're also seeing that start to recover and pick up again as people are getting out into the economy and consumer confidence is increasing. So that's, that's still modulating and still a variable that's moving. And then we also have changes in output. Um, there has been chip shortages, supply chain issues. I know you guys have all heard about everything that's happening with used cars and the car market and shortages there. Um, and so these are just a few key indices, um, and I really just wanted to point out the used cars and trucks um, indices, where it's jumped almost 30% in price, um, which kind of likely has to do with um, a chip shortage and kind of changes in the supply chain. So these are a few of the theories for the cause of the current inflation, just some of the main ones. So like I talked about before, there's a supply shock. So maybe there's a change in the amount of goods available to purchase, and there's an increase in the price. There could also be misleading comparisons. Um, when you're talking about gasoline, most of the country was staying at home. So the prices dropped considerably, and maybe now we're seeing them pick back up to a point um, that we would have seen if the pandemic hadn't happened. So, you know, maybe the price isn't shifting all of that much. And then there's also monetary policy, where we've increased the money supply, and the price level can increase. Or it can just be a lot of these things, and most economists kind of think there's a lot of moving pieces going on here. Um, so this was the most recent sectoral report, and it's in your packets. I know this is a lot of uh, text. Um, but the all item CPI, which is the CPI most people focus on, is at 5%. But the core CPI, with removing food and energy, is at 3.8%. So if you do remove those, it seems uh, the inflation kind of seems less. I'm just going to point out some of the volatile indexes. Um, energy, um, particularly gasoline and fuel oil, are up 56% and 50%. Used cars and trucks, like I mentioned before, are up 30%. Um, transportation services are up 11%. Um, and apparel, because people weren't buying a lot of new clothes when they were at home. Um, and then we also have some more stable indices, such as uh, food, electricity, um, shelter, medical care in general. Um, so there, there seems to be a lot of pressure in some areas, but we're not seeing a lot of pressure in other areas. There's a pretty big difference going on. So the Federal Reserve had a recent meeting 
Um, I'd like to point out first, last year they shifted their policy to 2% inflation over the longer term, which means they're not necessarily concerned if inflation's higher than 2% this year. They just like it to average to um, around 2%. Um, they decided to keep the federal funds interest rate at zero to 0.25% until maximum employment is achieved. And that is an important question of maximum employment because we've had a lot of retirements recently. We've had a lot of people that might stay permanently out of the labor force, either because of retirement or they decide to take on caretaking duties at home. Um, and there's also, in their report, they mentioned that they have increasing uncertainty and perceived risk in their economic projections. Um, the latest projections are 3.4% inflation in 2021 and 2022 to have 2.1 percent inflation. And although they said that there is increasing uncertainty and increased risk, they still voted unanimously to keep on the current track with their monetary policy. Um, and that concludes my presentation. If you guys have any questions. Senator Gibbons. <clears throat> Let me start by saying well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you for uh, your insights and your thoughts. This slide will work well for my question, and an earlier slide would, is, would also. You had mentioned um, as, we, as we seek to compare where we are today to, and that's my question, do we compare to, let's say, August of 2020 when we were in the midst of COVID mm -hmm. and dealing with the lockdown, or do we compare to August of 2019 as a baseline to say we're seeing inflation? And, and, and so specific to that question, is this point of 3.4 and 2.1 that they're projecting, what are they comparing that relative to? They're comparing it relative to 2020. Um, the, the baseline projection that I mentioned in 2019 is uh, just uh, economists kind of the trying to figure out if what the drivers of inflation are. Uh, so they're comparing it to, to the 2020 price levels. Which 2020 was an aberration. That, I think that's why there's been a lot of discussion about these current numbers. You think they're right, 3.4 and 2.1 or not? <laughs> The Federal Reserve isn't sure, so I'm not sure if I can <laughs> say. I'll, ju I'll jump in. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think what the Federal Reserve, uh, and I'm not, I'm not putting words in their mouth, but I think what they're, what they're signaling is, is their current thinking is that this is transitory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for some of the reasons Katie, Katie talked about, supply shocks, chip shortage, right? It's a transitory effect, right? It, at some point, that's going to resolve itself. Um, and I think that's why um, I think that's why you see their I don't want to call it long term because 2022 isn't really long term. Right. Um, I think that's why you see them returning to sort of their baseline projection of of 2 percent inflation. It, they view this as transitory. Um, I think there is a lot of debate among economists about about how we do these comparisons and where we're at. But I think I think the general general consensus maybe maybe it, is that it is transitory and and that these are temporary pressures so mr chairman if I, brief follow-up so what i'm hearing you say is that they put out a 3.4 and they put out a 2.1 but they're quietly saying we don't have a lot of confidence in these numbers that we're putting out i i don't know if i'd go so far as to say they don't have a lot of confidence they voted unanimously they would not, never say not that, to change their policy they, right, so right. obviously uh, they think it's transitory and that, uh, you know, there has been a uh, significant, and Katie spoke to this, significant increase in the money supply, right? Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, fiscal stimulus. There's going to be some upward pressure on, on prices, naturally, um, for various reasons, those among them. Um, but I think what the, what the Fed is signaling is that that it is transitory and that... Are you starting to hear any in, in their tone or in their statements, or are you starting to hear any little bit of wavering of confidence? Are they starting to acknowledge that they may they may have not had their fingers on the controls as well as they thought? Well, uh, I, 
I, I don't know that I would put it that way. Um, I will say that in their previous meeting, the month before, I believe their projections were three quarters of a point lower than the 3.4. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously uh, they've, they've revised their current thinking. Um, I do believe later today they'll release the minutes from that meeting. They met in mid-June, I think. And um, until we see the minutes, we're not really privy to, to the conversation, the actual conversations that happened at that meeting. And so those minutes may provide a little more insight to get at your question of, of their current thought processes. Uh, and we'll also get another glimpse here very shortly. They're going to meet again June, July 27th, I think. Um, so we may get even, an even better glimpse then. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I've got a couple up here, and uh, certainly, you know, I've, I've worried for a while that this shift in the federal funds rate going so low removes the primary tool of the Fed to influence things when, when we begin to have unemployment inflationary pressures, and they kind of surprised me with the corporate bond purchases and the aggressiveness in that program there. But, um, you know, uh, so if you take back to the Fed Board of Governors that I'm a little concerned. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, Senator Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what an excellent explanation of a very complicated subject. And if you went through that about three or four more times, it might sink in a little bit. So, so with the, uh, the influx of, of, of cash into the system, you said like a 75% increase. So, so do these formulas and do these elements uh, to maintain the balance, that being, I, I'm assuming, an unprecedented event, uh, do those formulas still stand true or is that yet to be seen? And is that the trick to getting us back to being normal is to try to balance all these elements out without going to an extreme on the other end? Does that make any sense? I, I think balancing it out without any extremes is the goal of the Federal Reserve right now. And they, they do have some tools of, available to them, uh, like the three that we we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. but um, it, the the formula I showed is more of like a theory or like a mathematical way to think about it. So, so yeah. even even in unprecedented events like we've undergone the last year, that's that still stands true in the way that this will be approached. So, with all of these these uh, major decisions that were made, uh, there it could be done with a level of prediction with all the influx of cash. Um, there, there, there are predictors on what's going to happen as a result of that influx on obviously the prices going up uh, and then with supplies being diminished. Uh, and I guess that's what they've struggled through is to try to understand the impact of all those different elements long term. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And I'd also throw in, keep in mind that um, they're trying to do this in real time too right um in contemporaneous data sometimes is and by contemporaneous i mean real-time data right is sometimes uh, much harder to come by economists are very good at looking looking back right and thinking about things from a historical perspective uh, forecasting is an art and is a much much different animal um but I, I again i'm not putting words in the fed's mouth but i think it's i think it's telling that they haven't changed their stance, that they're still, uh, they voted unanimously to to uh, not change policy right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If you ever teach a class, I want to sign up. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for your presentation as well. Um, as if I was doing a little math here, I think the first three months of this year, uh, fiscal stimulus and injected about $11 trillion into the economy at that time. We didn't know whether it would be spent or invested or whatever. The Fed didn't, didn't understand that. But is the Fed inflation projection of 3.4% and 2.1%, is that based on core CPI or traditional CPI? That's actually um, based on uh, the it's the producer consumer the pce the personal consumption i'm sorry mike's on sorry uh the pc 
The Fed actually looks at a slightly different measure uh, of inflation called the PCE, the personal consumption mm -hmm. expenditure. Um, the basket differs a little bit. I don't have them sit right in front does of Does it include food and energy? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Very well. Oh, President Petrie. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned, someone mentioned crystal ball, so prognostications. Um, the numbers that I continue to review looks like maybe transitory because it's not broad based enough yet. Mm -hmm. uh, continues to grow, so we'll see what that exponential growth where it slows and comes back down hopefully soon and hopefully doesn't continue to expand. But can you prognosticate a little with the crystal ball if money supply is increased through another one, two, six trillion dollar infusion at the federal level? Uh, should this committee and the General Assembly be uh, overly concerned with another large infusion with the money supply going up? Uh, or, well, we'll just see. I left my crystal ball in my office. Uh, um, I'm not being flippant. Uh, again, I. there are some very bright folks on the Federal Reserve Board. And uh, I, I tend, you know, my professional opinion would be uh, to, to listen, listen to their sage advice. And to the extent that they are not expressing um, a great deal of worry right now, I, I, think, uh, I think we should listen to that. Perfectly good economic and legal answer. Appreciate it. Thank <laughs> uh -huh. you. Very good. All right, guys. As stated, excellent presentation. Appreciate you guys today and all that you do, and we'll look forward to talking more soon. Great. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. All right. Next up, uh, talk a little bit about pensions. So, David Eager, come on up, sir. All right, Dave, identify yourself for the record and yeah. jump right in. All right. I'm David Eager. I'm the executive director of the Kentucky Public Pension Authority, and I have on Zoom also uh, Rebecca Atkins, who's our executive director of Office of Operations, and Aaron Surratt, who's our executive director of benefits. I had a, a presentation this morning to the General Government Finance Personnel and Public Pension Committee, and I started off by thanking them, uh, not only for being there, but thanking them for the fact that we got a bill passed in 2021 that was significant. Uh, as you may recall, House Bill 8 passed unanimously in the House and unanimously in the Senate. I think roughly 125 people voted. Nobody voted against it. I imagine most of you in this room voted for it. Um, I, I don't know case by case, but I thank those who did because uh, uh, Representative DuPlessis, uh, the sponsor of the bill, he, he, he characterized it in one word, fair because each employer is now going to pay their own share of the liability, not have somebody else perhaps subsidize it or be forced to pay somebody else's. Uh, I characterize it one word, impact. It's going to have a significant impact on the, getting uh, the retirement systems, the, the K and the C and the state police systems, financially viable, strong over a long period of time. Uh, there really are uh, there's three events. Uh, I think when we look back in uh, 28 years, when these plans are fully funded, 100% funded, and that that depends on uh, continuing to fund what the actuary says to fund, that depends on earning the uh, the uh, achieving the assumptions that are built into it, the economic assumptions and the mortality assumptions. If all those assumptions are met and we get the money, we're going to be fully funded in 2048. And again, I think we'll look back at three things. Number one, Senate Bill 2 passed in 2013, and it did two extremely important things. It established um, 
the tier three, which got the state out of the active liability business, also reduced the normal cost from tier one's 13 percent, tier three is three percent. So we're gradually going to bring down that normal cost rate, which the composite is 10.10 .10 right now. It's going to keep dropping. Uh, and again, if we got to a pure tier three, uh, and that was all, the only participation, the uh, normal cost rate would be for the pension would be just under 4 percent. And it also um, required that the actuarial, the ARC be paid in full instead of a 12 year period, which you we went through where we got about 40 cents on the dollar. Uh, we're getting 100 cents on a dollar. That's that's event number one. Event number two, uh, which could be transitory, I hope not, but the our board in 2017 reset the economic assumptions. I'm not going to go into all the detail of them, but um, and uh, approved changes in mortality in the 2019 period. But the 2017 economic assumptions resulted in a bump in the uh, funded st unfunded status of about five billion dollars. It raised the liability by five billion dollars. It was really recognizing what it's going to take to pay. And it raised the contribution rate for the K-9 has from 49 percent to 83 percent. So that said, here's what we got to pay to make that happen. It's to, and I commend the legislature on biting that bullet. That was a hard bullet to bite. But those three, those three events, I think we're going to look back and say uh, significant. I know uh, I hear Senate Bill Two all the time. I think we're going to start hearing Senate Bill, uh, Senate uh, House Bill Eight a lot. But here's why Eight was. Here's why we had we needed eight. Uh, we saw employment in the K-9 has plan declining dramatically, and as you can see, from over 46,000 to, if I can read the scale, a little over 35,000. Every time an employee we reduce a, an employee in the system, we re, we lose that contribution. If that person's making fifty thousand dollars and they're no longer in the system, we're losing forty-two, roughly forty-two thousand dollars in contribution. And so, what do we have to do? the The dollar amount that's owed doesn't go down; it's, it stays the same. I mean, the liability is there, so we have to raise the contribution rate, and that's exactly what happened. We call it the contribution death spiral. Rate goes down, um, the rate goes up, employers cut back, cutting back forces the rate to go up. So the, the, uh, we calculated the liability on June 30th of 2019, and we said, all right, everybody's going to say pay the percent share that their liability is of the total. And if your liability is $140 million and the total is $14 billion, you're going to pay 1%. And you're going to keep paying 1% until it's paid off. Whether you hire people, fire people, what, whatever, it's, uh, you, you, the, the unfunded liability is going to be paid off. I'll give you an example of what was going on. You see the line. Regional Mental Health reported to us in, t in 2009, they, they reported 8,399 employees to us, about, about uh, 8,400. Last year, they reported 1,944. So that's a 77% decline, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to move quickly to the uh, kind of a financial update, but I, I want to reinforce that. This, this bill was necessary. It's, it's going to be a, have a tremendous positive impact. In the short run, it may have some pain for people, but we, we absolutely need it, and we appreciate your support. I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump ahead a couple of slides. Okay, here's the highlight of... Uh, uh, through May 31st, here's the highlight of performance and cash flow, and then I'm going to go into a little more de detail, but st starting at the top, performance. The all-pension year-to-date performance, that's lumping it all together, through May 31st, 23.05% resulted in another $2.9 billion in assets. So that's the aggregate number of, uh, that's through May 31st. If you take it through uh, June 30th, my best estimate will add another 75 basis points. So we'll be almost 24 percent. It's a phenomenal year. It also followed a year where we earned 1.15. So, um, and then and then you add value. Uh, the market the market gave us a tremendous amount. We added value to that. Uh, we look at saying if we had taken our asset allocation, 
targets and invested them in index funds or market indices, what would we earn? And then what did we really earn? We overweighted, underweighted, we picked managers, we bought securities. Do we add value? And the answer is almost $177 million. So our investment committee and, and, and more, more probably more impactful are four-person investment department. Uh, the decisions they made in the pension added $176 million. If you do the same thing with the insurance, we add another $77 million, roughly, versus the benchmark. There's going to be times, if I'm here long enough, so there's going to be times when I come in and I say, we detracted. We, we did not add value. But right now, we, we're in a, you know, in a very positive period. And we have been for almost every year-to-date period. If you go back one year, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we've added at least slight margins. Cash flow, uh, the K plan, and I'm focusing on, uh, uh, on, on the K versus the C. The K, the K non has was 193 million positive. With investment income, it, uh, it goes to 234. So that, go back to that 49% going to the 83, that has helped us tremendously in cash flow. The C plan is still phasing in, they're, they're still in negative cash flow. So without investment income, just purely contributions and benefits and expenses they were down 218 million negative with the investment income they're still down 100 uh, uh, slightly over 100 million so I w we'll look at uh, a little more detail on performance I'll try to get you to focus here on uh, there's a lot of numbers up uh, the first column is, is the market value uh, as of 531. Second is year-to-date performance. And let me just let me just stay with Canon has. That's the easiest. They're all going to be pretty much in the ballpark. The C plans will be a little better than the K, and and the insurance will be a little better than the K Canon has pension. But year-to-date up 20.4 percent. It'll probably be 21. Uh, the one-year number, which will go back through June one of last year, 22 percent, and so forth. If you go out, the worst period of time is the last 20 years. And even, uh, even in the last 20 years, uh, we had good market returns. The, the uh, market returns over that 20 year, stock market returns was 8.35. After you net out some of the lower returning assets, we were 6.4. I'll remind you the uh, assumptions five and a quarter. Uh, it's maybe a tough bogey to match or beat uh, in, in, the, in the coming year, but this past year has been, again, phenomenal. Um, the other thing is uh, when we break uh, break each of the plans down about their return versus their benchmark, uh, we're five out of five. Uh, and in almost every period, there's one period where uh, in the 20-year period uh, for the state police, we're 10 basis points under. But every cumulative period, the performance exceeds uh, the benchmark. Cash flow, I gave you the highlights. I'll point to a couple of numbers. Um, upper left, uh, this is the K9 has member contributions. 2021, 82 million. 2020, 89 million. That's the last phase of the re reduction in employees and members and, uh, and the loss of contributions associated with that. That's going to change. We won't see that kind of a decline based on payroll con uh, issues. Um, you know, it's generally good news in the K plans. We have more inflows, contribution inflows, than we do contribution outflows. So we have net positive contribution all the way across. If you add in the gains, unrealized gains, you get a, a nice a greater bump for fiscal 21 because of the markets. This, by the way, goes just through uh, March 31st. Insurance plans on the next page. Pretty much the same. I don't want to short shift the insurance funds because they're pretty substantial, but the cash flows are, are good. Now, uh, in the, I think it was a PPOB meeting in, in March or April, we were reporting pretty good market returns. And Representative Tipton said to me, can you speculate <laughs> on the impact if we stopped today, what was the what would happen to the funded status? And I said I could, but it would be speculating. 
Uh, we had three months to go. The markets could do a lot in that three months. I don't have the liability number. I said I'd hate to throw a number out, have the, you all, the media, and everybody else pick it up and then find out we're way off the mark. So we waited until June 24th, and I asked GRS, our actuary, to say to me, all right, I can tell you what the assets are on June 24th. I would have waited until the 30th, but we didn't have enough time. Christian. If, uh, if the 24th assets are the ending asset value, tell me what the funded status is going to be and the contribution rate. How much impact is it going to have on both of those? We did it for K-non has and for C-non has, pension only. But I'll show you what it, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice bump. So box on the left, unfunded liability. Current means if we were continuing uh, at, at the assumed earnings rates and others, what would that uh, kind of the current pl plan, if you expectation, if you forecast, thirteen billion six ninety five. Um, the new projection, thirteen billion four thirty three. It doesn't change much because we change the we have to f do a five year amortization of this big gain we got in the investments. It doesn't hit on year one. So it's going to take five years for that big gain to work its way through the system. So five years out, now we have $628 million less in unfunded liability. And we see that the contribution rate goes from 23 to 26, or the fund funded ratio, rather, 23 to 26%. Um, what's happened, uh, and I, I want to explain something. I, I say this over and over, and, and I hope you don't get tired of hearing it, but Paying off this li liability, we're now got 28 years to pay it off. It's like paying off a 20-year mor 28-year mortgage, and the payment we make this year goes almost entirely to principal. I'm, I'm sorry, it goes <laughs> goes to interest. Very little to principal. Just like just like a home mortgage, you start your first year and you make your payments and you get your you know you get a $200,000 mortgage and at the end of the year you still $188,000. You go, gee, we didn't make much progress here. Well, you make a little more the next year, a little more the next year. We bottomed out in, in uh, fiscal year 18. 19 is when the new assumptions took place. 19 is when we started getting the higher contribution rate. But in 2018, it was 12.9. That was a funded rate. It was by far, as you know, the worst in the country. I mean, nobody was even close. It went to 13.4, so we gained 50 basis points. Then it went to 14.2, we gained 80 basis points. Now we're going to be gaining, you know, projected we're going to be gaining uh, about 400 basis points, between 350 and 400 basis points. So we're, we're projecting it's going to be in the 18% range because of the markets. As you look forward, you can see it stays that we keep that kind of premium until the end. So um, translating that into, uh, and by the way, this is June 24, I mentioned, uh, if you look at uh, June 30, uh, we're up about a tenth of a percent. So these no, these numbers are pretty good. GRS would say plus or minus two percent is a pretty fair guess when they finally do their final numbers. But um, and by the way, this projection says we're going to earn whatever it was 23 percent, let's say in fiscal 21, and then we're going to earn five and a quarter every year thereafter. That's how they've come up with this number, saying we got a one, kind of a one-time uh, benefit. Contributions. Start in the left. Uh, we were projecting a, a, a billion thirty-four. Now they're saying a billion twenty-four. Again, a small impact up front, uh, but we quickly get up towards about sixty million a year. So the markets gave us a, uh, if we can earn five and a quarter here for on average. We aren't going to do it every year. Some are better and some are worse, but on average, uh, we're going to be we're going to be reducing the contribution in the area of 58 million a year. And the um, employer contribution rate will come down as well on the right. We did the same with the C plan, and, I, and we say repeatedly, you know, we only have $3 billion in the K non has, and it's got $16.5 billion in liability. The assets don't have a huge impact. We're seeing a pretty nice impact here, but in general, the asset we have too few assets. If we had five times these assets, 
if we were 15 billion in assets and 16 billion in liability, we had had one tremendous. Uh, we'd had a 23 percent times uh, 12 billion dollars. You know that would be a, just an enormous impact. But we're dealing with such a small amount here. K has a little better situation, or C has a little better situation. So here's their projections. It's saying take take today's 2021 gains, which are a little bigger than the K, just a little bit, and then earn six and a quarter going forward. So they get up in the uh, 2027 uh, with a, a 1.4 billion less in liabilities. They move their five-year out number from 55% funded to 63% funded. Uh, and that narrows a little bit in the difference, but we get to 2049, we get to 100%. If they earn six and a quarter, if the payroll growth is 2%, if the mortality is what we think it is, and so forth. And then finally, so what happens to their contributions? Their contributions, um, five years out, instead of 683, we would project to be 561. There's $122 million less contributions. That, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a nice change from what's historically been the case, and that is we kept to put more money and more money and more money in. I'm open to questions if you have. All right, very good, Dave. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, first of all, for me, um, when does the rate collar, remember we did that rate collar with CERS when the cities came in the other year, worried about their increase. When does that rate collar end? Uh, I'm gonna have to, I don't know. Re Rebecca, you're on the line. Um, I believe it was a 10 year window that began in 18. It was a five year window. It got five year window that began. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. It's going to, they're going to catch up before the end of the window. So they'll be where they would normally have been uh, before the window gets there. When, when do you think I'm that? Sorry, would be? I'd have to look that up. I'm okay. Yeah, just, well, shoot me an email when you get a chance. I'm just, just to, I will. If, yes. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the projections, uh, the, the, even the current is going to peak at, uh, and this is pension only, peak in 22. At 23.6, and then head down to 23.1. So we're we're essentially there. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Representative Prunty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want a point of clarification on slide 11. You said billions, but you've got millions on your slide. Was that just a <laughs> slip? Uh, no, those are millions. Millions. Okay. I thought it's a thousand millions. Okay. Yeah. It's confusing. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you're dealing with billions and millions, it's <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Anybody else? Oh, Senator Gibbons. Thanks for the presentation. Well done, as always. And one of the components of House Bill 8, and you spoke to it, was assigning liability to the employers. Crucially important. Mm -hmm. Crucially important. As you well know, there are some that have questions about the bill the amount that was assigned to them in that process. Summarize for us those conversations. Sure. And uh, what what do you recommend going forward to us as policymakers as we continue to have conversations with constituents, constituent groups that say, we still don't think our numbers are right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how they know they're wrong, but we have a process to try to help them determine that. Um, first of all, statute says that the GRS calculation is the calculation. Whatever GS, GRS says is, is. A GRS would also admit, and we would too, that there may be employees that they're being charged for that are not their last, where they are not the last employer. And we would say, if that's the case, that's a mistake, and we will take that person out of the, uh, out of the, the equation. So. 40, we, we have 100, roughly 110 uh, employers. 44 of them have appealed. They've, they've gotten their information, most of them. They've gotten their employer information. They've gotten the Social Security number. If they cannot leave the system, they've also got the liability for each person. If they can leave the system, we've given employer and, and Social Security number. So they can go down that list of names and say, we don't think that person was here 
or we don't think we should be charged with that person. So we're going with those 44, we're going through a process of looking at our records and their records. Um, Quite frankly, many of the employers don't have good long-term employment information. That sounds funny, but that's the truth. But that's the resolve we're going through. Um, they've, the ones who can leave have asked for the liability by person. And my, my comment is, what are you going to do with it? You, you, can't determine, you can't determine any one person's liability unless you have their entire career history, what they made, did they buy service, who's the beneficiary. There's a lot of information that they would need to replicate what GRS can do. And they can't. And, and they shouldn't get that information. That's private information that belongs to the members. And we are adamant about that. There's no reason, there's no reason that we should be giving employers who that person's beneficiary, how much money they made, when they're going to retire. That's private information to that member. And we would hold strongly to that. Um, I, I had another pa passing thought here. Um, but uh, we will adjust if we have to. I and mean, if we can establish that, uh, uh, that some of these 44 members, that they're, they, uh, they have, uh, uh, they, many of them do have employee, um, members assigned to them that are uh, really are state workers and they were reimbursed for. Like Eastern Kentucky University had a lot of them. We take, take those out. Um, there's some issues with uh, some of the, uh, at least one of the mental health departments as to whether these people are theirs or not that we're working through. But I would encourage you strongly, and I know that there may be legislation, not to require us to provide member, individual member information. It's not only is it uh, not necessary, it, it's not for a business purpose. And that, that's number one. Number two is um, it can be hacked. It's one more place in private information, PII, would be resident that could be hacked. If I didn't sound forceful enough, <laughs> we're, we're pretty adamant about it. We're definitely opposed to, we'll do, we'll do member, we'll do social security, we'll do uh, liability if, uh, if they can't leave the system. But that. So brief follow up, so clarify for me, and I, I did hear you, and you were very strong and adamant. You are saying that in this process of, of working with employers, no employers have received the individual employee liability information. No, no employers. No, uh, I, I misspoke if I said that. Uh, I think the number is 54 that got it, and they are ones who cannot leave the system, so they can't really use that liability number to the disadvantage of a member. The ones that can leave, and I, I, I don't have my morning presentation, I think there's about 24 of them. The ones that can leave, we said, we'll give you, we'll give you member Social Security, we won't give you individual liability. I said, and I've said, what are you going to do with it? And the guy said, well, you know, I know, I'll know, he's a head of an agency, I'll know what my liability is, and I'll be able to look at some of my employees and say, that doesn't look right. And I said to him, how, do you, how can you tell? You don't know where they've worked, you don't know what they've made, you don't know what service purchase they may have on, you don't have the information that's required to develop that. And and, and it kind of comes back to this, uh, the two primary issues, I think, it's a, a business purpose. You don't need it as a business purpose. And number two, it's confidential. So give me those numbers again. 54 uh, received the information? Yeah. Uh, Aaron, have you got my morning presentation here? <laughs> I've got it. It's 54 received the liability because they are not eligible to cease. 22 did not receive the liability because they are eligible to cease, and an additional five who? Five of them agreed. We, here's, what, here's what they said. So, so what would you do with it? And they said, well, we'd, we'd add it up to make sure that the total of all these people adds up to what we're, we're being told. And I said, your CPA could do that, right? Absolutely. OK, we'll give it to your CPA with a, non, with a non-disclosure agreement. And five of them said that. They simply were summing the, uh, that's what they were, the way they described They would sum each individual to make sure the total was tied. But I've, you know, we've had a lot of spirited discussions with a number of people. 
I'll tell you one, the th one thing that uh, uh, Representative Duplessis argued with me, or not argued, debated with me one time, and he's right. Um, House Bill 8 took a lot of the ability for these people to, uh, these people, employers, and I don't want to say they're all doing this, because they aren't. We have people, uh, we had meetings with uh, uh, Joe Dan uh, Beaver. He's not, his organization's not doing that, but there are a lot of them that are cutting back, and they're using liability information to make decisions about individual people. So um, that's that was the, the gist of not wanting to give them that information. Very good. Senator Givens, you good? All right. Dave, as always, yeah. thank you very much. All right, no, moving I'm, along. I'm sorry. Yeah, I did say, I, I did say, with the Duplessis, House Bill 8 fixed that a lot of that problem. So You said yeah. Duplessis created a problem with House Bill 8. We'll pass it along. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, not, I, I, no, no, I'm no. teasing. It's the other way around. I'm teasing. All right, good deal. All right, Bo, you're up. And... Uh, for the members of grandizement before he gets going we've asked Bo to jump around just a little bit here because i figured uh we'd be growing long in in the uh meeting at this point so Bo, go ahead okay yes mr chair i'm just uh trying to find my powerpoint uh Fortunately, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bo Barnes. I serve in the positions of uh, Deputy Executive Secretary and General Counsel for the Teachers Retirement System. Uh, I was asked today to uh, cover and provide a high-level overview of a couple of topics, and because of the number of items on the agenda, I've been asked to shorten this PowerPoint presentation and focus on a, a couple of key items. Uh, and those are something called the experience study and, and also uh, how the experience study relates to the budget. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and proceed. Uh, so the experience study. Uh, first, just real briefly, uh, what an experience study is. An experience study is a standard exercise by actuaries across the nation to review assumptions that they have projected for retirement systems. Uh, and I say assumptions they have projected for retirement systems because these assumptions are forward-looking. And no one can predict the future accurately, obviously, you know, exactly, uh, obviously. So uh, the review of those assumptions is both a prudent and it's a necessary exercise uh, by these actuaries to do this periodically and in review, review them. And so a couple things that they're doing with these experience studies uh, one, uh, and for us, it's a five-year look back. You know, in most large public pension plans, they do use experience studies every five years. So what they do is they look at the assumptions that they had for a prior five-year period and then compare those assumptions, what they projected to happen, with what actually happened over that five-year period. Um, and then it's, it's an opportunity to make adjustments to these assumptions, okay? And they also uh, they do not just look back over the last five years. Uh, they also look at what might happen in the future. So they have a wealth of resources and data for that, like from the private sector. They are looking at material from, well, for example, private sector investment consultants. Uh, and they're looking for data from like the federal government. And they're t taking all this wealth of information and trying to make, you know, projections going to the future in addition to looking at what happened over the previous five years. Uh, and again, it's an opportunity to make adjustments to these assumptions. And, and what we're trying to do here is to, you know, pay off this legacy unfunded liability. We started off with a 30-year amortization period. We're down to about 24 years in that amortization period to pay off that unfunded liability. And these assumptions, which include things like investment returns and mortality and rates of retirement, they're important because they help us identify funding needs and funding sources. And of course, that 
is directly tied in to the budget. A um, couple of things, and uh, uh, this uh, this experience study in particular, this one, uh, the timing is different from past experience studies. Um, normally, these experience studies are not normally always in the past. They are something that they are concluded after the close of the fiscal year in which they are begun. And then they are presented to our board of trustees at their September board meeting, okay? But this experience study is different, and there's a lot of uh, interest in this experience st study. And uh, a lot of people were asking, you know, whether these assumptions were going to change, and if they were, how much? And that, that's all understandable, you know. Uh, where are we going with this? So, uh, and uh, we asked our actuaries to expedite uh, the timeline for this experience study. So we got it completed uh, three months earlier, essentially, you know, before this close of the fiscal year. It's presented to our board on uh, uh, June 21st. So we have that. Uh, Presenting it at this point of time, there, there are certain things we don't have that normally we would have with experience studies, and most significantly, we don't have fiscal year in 21, 2021 information data, okay? We don't have that today. We're just, even though we're even a few days into the new uh, fiscal year, we don't have those f figures, and we don't even have preliminary figures at this point. Now, that is something as we start getting, for example, investment manager reports and then everything else, employer reports, and we start begin analyzing, reviewing, uh, auditing, reconciling, correcting errors. We, we start at some point, uh, we'll start to have some preliminary data uh, on based on this experience study. And that data certainly will be of provided as soon as we have it, okay? Uh, and just to give you a little more detail on the timeline, uh, we are required to submit our budget to the budget office by October 15th, um, and then we'll have an annual actual valuation for fiscal year 21. That is to be concluded by November 15th. And once we have that, we have the final numbers, the final annual valuation for this fiscal year that just ended, then we will submit a revised budget request to the budget office sometime after November 15th. So just sort of give you a timeline. Um, and just a couple more things about this experience study before I get into some of the details. And certainly we have some very important information to share with this committee today. We are going to be able to share with you the changes to those assumptions. Um, a couple of things. Uh, this experience study for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020, does not have the current fiscal year, obviously, okay? And notably about the current fiscal year, uh, we had a, a exceptional investment returns for TRS. A couple of months ago, I presented to the Public Pension Oversight Board that just for the first nine months of the, the 21 fiscal year, uh, returns were at 23%, okay? Uh, we added $4 billion just to the pension fund in the first nine months of fiscal year 21, another half billion dollars to the health insurance trust, okay? So none of that is part of this experience study. Something else, because I get asked this, uh, uh, that's not in this experience study, is it does not also include a very significant piece of pension legislation that was enacted by the General Assembly in this most recent session, and that's House Bill 258. It established a new benefit tier for individuals who become members of TRS for the first time on or after January 1st, 2022, okay? And that pension bill did a lot of things. It raised, for example, minimum retirement age to age 57. That's the earliest teachers in this new tier will be able to retire. But even more significantly than raising retirement age to a minimum age of 57, uh, it, it provided that the Commonwealth will have no responsibility for any developing unfunded liability should one develop for this new tier group. And Bo, I'm going to push you along a little bit. Sorry, you, you oh. kind of you got put at the end and I'm trying to get us out yes, of sir. here by three o'clock. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of what we need okay. to hear yes, about sir. this. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, this is a high level overview that we've been asked to provide. So this is high level, but certainly any questions, more than happy to to take those. So th these are the most significant changes to assumptions that impact the budget and our budget request. We are lowering the investment return assumption from 7.5% for the pension fund to 7.1%, okay? Um, and there's another slide just to give you a little more background on that, and, and I will hurry, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're lowering the payroll, th payroll growth assumption from 3.5% to 2.75%. Uh, payroll growth increases two ways. Number of teachers, the more teachers you have, the more total payroll you have, 
Uh, also, uh, if teachers are getting increases in compensation, that can also increase payroll growth. But it's been lowered from three and a half to 2.75. And then also very significantly, and this is very interesting, um, there's been a lot of discussion about how maybe different segments of the population are going to have different mortality rates, okay? And I'll just cut to the chase. For teachers, you know, there's been discussion about whether or not maybe they live longer because maybe they're better about going to see the doctor, taking their medications, and, and healthy living, that sort of thing. So the Society of Actuaries, uh, with the assistance of a bank of actuaries they had, have been working for years on developing mortality tables that are specific just to teachers. Okay, uh, before this new data set was available and became the final uh, uh, data set became available in 2019, uh, before we had that, uh, mortality tables were based on the general population. But with this new teacher specific mortality table, we did confirm what people were maybe thinking that teachers are living longer. Okay, so this is sort of a one off change with this new teacher specific mortality table and a change in you know, what we're going to see with budget requests and with liabilities uh, because you only do this once. You have a change from general population to teacher specific. We've done that now, okay? So we're going to see some increases that are probably going to be in future mortality uh, reviews or they're going to be closer to what we've had prior to this one, okay? Uh, the other thing they did with mortality tables this time is they, uh, they adopted a, a, a generational uh, approach to these mortality tables uh, in that uh, they are uh, projecting that younger individuals are going to have a longer lifespan than older individuals. And by that, I mean, for example, a 60-year-old might be projected now to have an 81-year uh, on average lifespan. Uh, and then by the 25-year-old, that's going to be adjusted up or because the actuaries are assuming they may live longer. So they're adjusting for the 25-year-old to say age 84, okay? So it's two things that are going on with these uh, new mortality tables. Um, for investments, just want to, we were at 7.1% as just reported. Um, this chart comes from uh, a nonprofit organization, NASRA, the National Association of State Retirement Administrators. They do a survey of uh, public plans uh, and they publish the results. And this shows the assumed rate of returns for these other public pension plans that were in the survey. Uh, most, 37, have a 7% assumed rate of investment return. The next, almost identical, 36, or between 7% and 7.5%. We're at 7.1%. So we're really, with these two combined groups where everybody is, we're kind of at the lower end of this. Uh, and 7.1%, it's a conservative projection, you know, particularly given the returns that uh, TRS has had in the past. You know, for that period ending March 31st, 2020, that I, 2021, I was talking about, um, you know, all time periods, whether it's one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, all those returns for all those time periods were above 7.1. So we're being very, actuaries are being very conservative with the 7.1% return assumption. Um, there's a lot I know on this slide, so I'll try to explain it. Um, so this slide um, reflects uh, the assumption changes that have the biggest impact on total liabilities, okay? And these are long-term liabilities. They stood at 35.5 billion dollars as of last June 30th. Uh, and as a result of these changes in these assumptions, for now, you see an increase of 2.95 billion dollars in total liabilities. These are long-term liabilities. Uh, some, most, Maybe even not all of these liabilities, are, or none of them are due now, but none of them may even have to be paid depending on what happens, what kind of experience we have going towards in the future. Uh, and, and, and particularly, you know, we've got $4 billion in gains in the pension just for the first nine months of the last fiscal year. That's obviously more than the, the $2.95 billion in additional liabilities that we see with this experience study. Um, the biggest drivers uh, in the increase in liabilities uh, with these assumption changes uh, are here. Uh, you have a $1.49 billion increase in liability due to those new mortality tables. You know, again, the teacher specific, it, it, this is a bigger increase than we're going to see in future years because we did something unique. We were able to do something unique this year, these newly developed teacher specific mortality tables. 
a $1.65 billion increase in liabilities is due to lowering that assumed it's just discount rate or also uh, assumed rate of return from 7.5% to 7.1%. Okay, and that's the biggest one. That's the biggest increase in liabilities is due to reducing the assumed rate of return from 75 to 7.1%. If we continue to earn 7.5% or better, as we have historically, that goes away. That doesn't exist. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> the third biggest driver of the changes in liabilities, uh, and it actually doesn't increase liabilities, it decreased liabilities, uh, and that is the individual salary assumptions for teachers. Uh, payroll growth, overall payroll growth is one thing. Again, it's number of teachers, are there more or less, Overall, how does their payroll grow with the salary or compensation increases? But a component of that is the underlying individual salaries. So when salaries are lower, or assumed to be lower, liabilities are lower. Lower because uh, uh, retirement allowances are based in part on salaries, on individual salaries. So when they lower payroll growth and they're lowering uh, individual salary projections for teachers, Lower salaries equals lower benefit payouts on the pension side, okay? So that's why when they lowered the assumed salary increases for teachers, you actually see a $400 million reduction uh, in total liability. So those are the three biggest drivers, and everything else outside of that they looked at is, is really much smaller. Um, uh, health insurance trust, uh, you kind of see the uh, same thing. We have the, the same drivers. Uh, you know, as far as mortality and uh, uh, investment rate of return assumption, um, the uh, lowered salary assumption does not matter because health insurance benefits are not based upon the salaries that teachers are earning. So uh, pretty much uh, we're, we're seeing, you know, the, the same drivers here with the exception of the lowered salaries. The two main drivers are the same for health insurance. And then very importantly, I get asked this question a lot, the assumption changes for health insurance do not change anybody's contributions to the retirement system. And the reason is those are all fixed contributions. Teachers will continue to pay the same 3% out of pocket to health insurance. School districts will continue to pay, match that at 3%. Retired teachers will say the same amount as well. So th none of those, those don't change for anyone. Um, if I could make a quick correction. Yes, sir. It will change for all the taxpayers who contribute to the general fund is who it will change for. It won't change for these employees in these school districts. That's who it will change for. I just – we lose those folks well, in this equation. Well – I just want to be sure that we're yeah. clear. And, 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 Mr. Chair, certainly on, on the pension side, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but on the medical insurance, because we're looking at fixed amounts, um, you know, we're going to – be requesting those same fixed contribution rates from that. I got that question from some employers too, because they were worried that their insurance contribution rates of the system were going to go up. So, all good points. Um, and again, keeping this at a very you know high level overview uh, for the budget, uh, we already have the budget request for the first fiscal year of the next biennial budget, and that of course is fiscal year 23. Uh, and we know that we're going to need an additional $629.4 million uh, from the budget uh, to, you know, uh, continue to fund the pension fund on an actually sound basis. You know, this is the additional funding that we weren't getting for a number of years, but in fiscal year 2017, we started getting the additional funding requested, and we've gotten that for, we're getting that now for five years in a row, and that's something we're very thankful for. That is a huge change that we're now getting this additional funding so we can implement that funding plan to pay off that legacy unfunded liability over what was 30 now 24 years so very thankful for this additional funding and we know it's gonna be 629.4 million dollar budget request for 2023 again we don't have uh, the request for 2024 yet because that's going to be based on the 2021 annual valuation which is not ready we don't have preliminary numbers even on that yet but again when those preliminary numbers are available you know uh, to us, we will provide those to everyone else and, uh, and continue to keep everyone updated as we refine those uh, preliminary numbers and as we eventually, you know, after we have the annual valuation, we'll have the final numbers for 2024 and then those will be provided to everyone. And this annual valuation is going to be 
it, it, it's going to be very significant. I have just one more slide, Mr. Chair, just yeah, to I'm show. Yeah, I'm going to give you about two minutes. I'm going to open for some questions. Yes, sir. Okay, so you can okay. wind down. Just, just one more slide to show the impact of the 2020 evaluation. And you heard uh, Dave Eager speak earlier. You know, uh, actuaries use a uh, smoothing uh, of uh, investment returns methodology to assess, you know, where we are about where we are. You know, like, for example, 20... 2009 was not a good measure of where the markets were going to be, you know, on average over the long term. Just like 2021 is not going to be either. So they use a five-year smoothing. So you'll see here the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the, the, the percentage uh, just uh, above the yellow one, negative 1%. One With this five-year smoothing, we're going to be dropping off a negative 1% in the five-year actual smoothing for the 2021 valuation and replacing it with this year. And I don't know what the final number for this year is going to be, but again, it was at 23% as of March 30th, uh, 2021. So again, I don't want to get ahead of this valuation because I don't know, but it's, it has the potential to have quite an, an impact on the next budget request. Thank you, sir. Very good. Okay. So um, that being said, if, you, if anybody wants more details on this experience study, this, that, and the other, um, Bo did a great job at the last PPOB meeting. I'm sure it's online. Check that out. Um, it's got a lot of good information to it. Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the $629.4 million in additional funding, uh, I just want everybody to understand that what we're talking about, uh, this is the additional funding necessary to uh, make the, actual, the unfunded liability whole on an annual basis above and beyond the statutory contribution it's already been paying every year. Yes, sir. So fiscal year 21, that you know, we have about $435 million that will be needed out of the SEEK formula. Mm -hmm. or, or for, I'm sorry, for, for 23, sorry. Uh, we'll have about $435 million to get the SEEK formula. So, you know, that will be part of, um, um, that, that's an addition to the 629. Yes, sir. One, one brief follow-up, Mr. Chair. Yeah. The, on the 629.4 for fiscal year 23, uh, how much of an increase is that over a current fiscal year uh, contribution that's been needed? So that, that's going, uh, that's an increase from the previous year uh, of, of about $50 million. $50 million. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to go to Senator Carroll next. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just in, in speaking of the process with the, this study, I'm assuming that basically in most areas, this study just comes back with ranges based on data that they've collected, and then the board makes the final decision as to where uh, where it falls in between that the range that's provided. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's a good question. That's a very good question. But uh, no, the, the uh, actuary under our statutes, they provide specific assumption numbers uh, and then the board has sort of process under the statute of just ratifying what those assumptions are that are established by the actual so the board doesn't have the authority to change any of those assumptions no sir fail to follow those assumptions uh, no sir it is it, okay. it, that the actual establishes those good okay. question very good thank you mr chairman thank you senator carolyn bow just real quick uh, to clarify for the committee you talk about when 16 drops off of there has a potential for a significant impact to the budget request so could you just provide for the committee significantly increase or decrease uh and and there's a lot of things that go in the valuation you know not just investment returns uh but investment returns are certainly one of the biggest drivers so uh, p potentially uh you know that that you know, with higher investment returns, there's less pressure on the budget. There's less pressure on the general fund to provide those dollars. So whatever those dollars are, uh, with rolling off 2016 and adding 2021, 20, uh, uh, we're going to see less pressure, you know, from the general fund because we're going to have more investment return on this rolling actual five-year smoothing average uh, to help make up uh, for the cost. Very good. With that, Bo, that's going to be the in for today for uh, your testimony. I apologize for pushing you as hard, hard as we had to. But understand. I am trying to get us out of here at three. So we got a few more quick things briefly. Um, you'll notice in your folder there uh, that there is correspondence from Jenny Bannister uh, in the office of the state budget director. If you have any questions, uh, please make sure to uh, note those to her. Also in here, you have a listing of correspondence received 
I'm sorry, reports received since uh, June 2021. Um, that's uh, costs associated with issuance of revenue bonds, uh, a uh, audit uh, uh, property assessment audit from Office of Property Valuation, uh, and various things throughout here to in include everything, uh, motorcycle rider education and others. So take a look at that list. If you're interested in it, get yourself a copy of that and make sure to study up on it. At this time, is there any other business to come before this committee? 